Um, so I am going, it's going to be a little bit of a change. I haven't worked on, as Esper said, HIV vaccines for about 15 years, but the last six years I've been working on tuberculosis vaccines. What I'd like to do is paint a picture of the field for you uh, without necessarily going into great detail in specific vaccines and to try to convince you why working on tuberculosis vaccines may be one of the most important things that's happening in our lifetime um, and is extremely important to HIV. Uh, so I'm going to paint the field of why I think that a TB vaccine uh, is possible in our lifetimes. I think there'll be a new TB vaccine uh, developed and licensed before there'll be an HIV vaccine. I have some bets at people with the foundation, the Great's Foundation, about that. And I'll explain to you why that is and why I think that we are on a path towards possibly a new tuberculosis vaccine. So first of all, mycobacterium tuberculosis is extremely unlike HIV. It has co-evolved with human over 70,000 years. So when you go into this, it is going to be almost a symbiont as much as a pathogen. And so this is important. It'll be very difficult to recognize how you might be able to make a vaccine against something that's co-evolved with humans. But I'll remind you that pertussis, smallpox, and a variety of other diseases have co-evolved with humans, and we have managed to make, make them uh, vaccines against them. The other thing is, is that TB is very different than other bacteria in that it has this mycolic acid sort of lipid wall which makes it quite difficult both to grow and to assess. And the nature of the capsule that surrounds TB, which I'm going to talk about to a certain extent, is actually not very well known because of the methodology we, methodologies we use in the lab to grow tuberculosis. So how does this thing change? There, oops. So let's first of all talk about TB. Why is it important? Well, over the last 200 years, one billion people have died of tuberculosis. One billion. This is WHO. So this is just dwarfs any other epidemic. It is far and away the most important pathogen. It is still the leading single cause pathogen of infectious disease death in the world. 1.6 million people in 2015, that's 400,000 people more than died of HIV. It is the leading cause of death in South Africa. Three times as many people in South Africa die of tuberculosis as die of HIV. There are 400,000 cases of HIV and TB deaths that are, are together it makes up about 25% of the TB deaths. But the number of cases of new TB and HIV is only 13%. So 80, about 87% of the cases of TB in the world are not related to HIV. So this is a very important pathogen. It also kills about 410,000 women per year. That's almost as much as the total number of malaria deaths in the world, which is quite important. There were 650,000 drug-resistant TB cases in 2013. Over 100 countries have talked about XDR-TB, which is extremely difficult to treat. And drug resistance obviously does not equal vaccine resistance, which means that if you can develop a vaccine against tuberculosis, you do not have to worry about whether it's XDR-TB or not. And I put on here, just to give you a sense over the last two centuries, the deaths from TB down here is, oops, got to get this pointer right. Down here is HIV and the number of people that died of AIDS and Ebola, the total number of, diag of known cases of deaths in Ebola in world history is overcome in three days by tuberculosis. So more, pe more people die of tuberculosis in three days than all the cases of Ebola that have ever been documented. This is a huge problem. So why don't we have a really good TB vaccine? So it's been a lack of vision and will, it's been a lack of tools and candidates, and it's been a lack of funding. And that's changed. And people in the vaccine field say, well, we don't have a TB vaccine because we don't have a validated animal model and we don't have a correlate. And the truth is, is neither one of those are absolutely necessary to developing a vaccine. In fact, the overwhelming majority of vaccines developed during world history never, neither had an immunologic correlate nor a validated animal model. Although it would be extraordinarily useful to have either of these, that should not be stopping us from making a vaccine. So a couple of things you, about, about the will and to making a vaccine. So first of all, the focus until recently has been on infants because of the EPI schedule. And the EPI schedule has been very problematic for vaccine developers because in the developing world, if you didn't do EPI, people sort of considered you crazy. But infants make up a very small minority of TB cases, about 10%. They are also not responsible for almost any of the transmission of TB. So if you're trying to break the transmission cycle, vaccinating infants is exactly the wrong group until they grow up, and it may take you 15 to 20 years to see an effect from that, because most of the transmission of tuberculosis occurs through adolescents, young adults, and in the very elderly population that cavitate 
Infants do not cavitate their lungs, and they are very difficult for them to transmit. There's also been a lack of clarity on the target profile. I'm going to talk about that. Should we go after latent patients? Should we go after naive, uninfected patients or therapeutic patients? And there's been a lack of understanding that a mediocre vaccine will prevent far more cases than any great new drug, and I'll show you data on that. There's been a lack of an advocacy community. So in the United States and other places, there's been a huge community of advocacy for HIV, which has caused massive funding in the HIV space, which has been fantastic. There is no advocacy community for tuberculosis, so to say. And there's been a lack of appreciation of time and investment. Just to give you a sense, this is the funding by the US government for HIV vaccines compared to TB vaccines compared to TB drugs. And it's about 10 times as much. So despite the fact that worldwide more, than, more people are dying of TB, we have 10 times as much funding into tuberculosis vaccines, and we have more funding into drugs than we do into uh, vaccines. There have been 109 products and 186 trials. When I counted them up over the last eight years in HIV, in TB we've had 16 products and 45 trials, most of those done by the organization that I was helping to, to run that Esper has talked about. And there's been also an appreciation of what will stop the epidemic. So there's been a concept that if you go out and you treat everybody with dots, that somehow you're going to stop the epidemic. And this is a very nice study that was published by a group out of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and Johns Hopkins, where they looked at the effect of new drugs that shorten treatment by four months, two months, or down to two weeks. And by doing a four-month drug regimen, of which there were three trials that cost the US government and the Gates Foundation approximately $160 million, you will get approximately a 2% decrease in the overall incidence of TB per year. So new drugs are not going to stop the epidemic. And the reason is, is that most of the transmission occurs before people are diagnosed. And therefore, getting a new drug and decreasing that time is not gonna make a difference. The other reason is, as soon as you are on one infective drug, your transmission essentially stops. So transmission stops, if you look at the guinea pig model, which I'll talk about, within a few days of the first active drug that you take. So getting new drugs is not the way to break the cycle of tuberculosis in the world. It's very important to get new drugs. We need to treat the patients that are there. I'm not trying to say we shouldn't. But trying to say that new drugs are going to have an effect on the epidemic is simply not true. So the WHO, after finally many, many years in 2014, came out and said, we want to have a 2035 where we want to get to 10 cases per 100,000 people. That's going to be the 2035 Millennium Goals. Those are now written down for tuberculosis. <laughs> and what they said is, well, the global trend is at 2% per year, and we're going to perform magic, uh, which is what they plan to do, and we're going to drop this to 10% per year by intensification of the DOTS regimen and by case finding. Uh, in 2015, the lowest, the best rate that was achieved worldwide was not 10%, it was 6.5%. That was achieved by the Chinese. The Chinese probably have the most intensive program for lowering TB of any group in the world. And they finally came out and said, there's one of two things that needs to happen by 2025. We either need to introduce a new vaccine or new prophylaxis for those patients that are latently infected so that we can figure out how to keep those patients that are latently infected from reactivating, and that will also affect the epidemic. And if you look at the models that have been done in three different studies, and if people would like the references, I'm happy to give them to you, to you, some of them listed here, it turns out that immunizations of adolescents and adults with a 60% efficacious vaccine, with a 90% coverage rate for infants, and a 20% coverage rate for adolescents and adults. So we looked at both of these. So this is what happens to the overall TB epidemic if you use a 90% effective TB vaccine for infants over the next years. And this is what happens if you use a vaccine that is 60% efficacious for adults and adolescents over the years, giving it at 10-year intervals. And this has been modeled in a variety of ways in an article by Gwen Knight, from, also from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And this vaccine, given to 20% of the population with a 60% efficacy, is modeled to prevent approximately 35 million potentially deaths over the next 50 years. So this is, the point being is, we do not need the perfect vaccine. All we need to do is go in and start to break the cycle. So what are the challenges of making a vaccine? So there's a lot of negativity, a lot of pessimism about making a new TB vaccine. 
and for, for a variety of reasons. One, so here's our present vaccine. We give BCG to infants, and I'll talk about that in a second. And BCG has a great diversity, and it appears that environmental factors may affect the diversity and the ability of, of TB, to, of that vaccine to work. TB's co-evolved, so it's, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. It's very hard to know what antigens to pick. There's 4,000 open reading frames in TB. It turns out that many of the most, most important antigens are hyper-conserved rather than variable. So it almost looks like TB is conserving the epitopes that the CD4 and CD8 positive T cells are active against in order to promote its own transmission. There's this lack of validated animal models. There's a lack of clear correlates of protection and immunity, even by BCG. And it, as this is a very important paper that I just mentioned by Comus that showed that the epitopes that are presented to by the immune system are more conserved than essential genes. That is, if you look at the synonymous to non-synonymous mutations, the lowest rate is in the genes that are seen antigenically, which means that those exact epitopes which are recognized, which we can make vaccines to, may actually be associated with the propagation of the bacteria. And the other problem is that even though TB is the leading single cause of pathogen death in the world, the incidence is only about at the highest levels, is only about 0.7 per, about 0.7 percent, and that's in places such as South Africa. And so it is very difficult to do trials because that means you need to enroll 130 patients just to get a single disease endpoint, and we have no other biomarkers upon which to do trials. So as I'll talk about in a little bit, efficacy trials usually run at between 25 to 40 million dollars, and that has limited the, the enthusiasm for pharmaceutical developers to enter into this field because it's too high a bar for them. So why would it be possible after saying all those negative things about making a TB vaccine? There are a lot of reasons. First of all, most people that get infected control the infection. So 90% of those three billion people in the world who are infected with tuberculosis will never develop tuberculosis. In fact, it's probably closer to 95%. So we do know how to control tuberculosis. We just simply yet do not yet know pathogenically why certain people control it and why other people don't. And there's been extremely, there have been a lot of studies looking at that and there are still no answers. There's also this really interesting phenomena called the golden years. And this graph represents that. So you see a fairly high incidence, and this is deaths, but incidence would be the same. The blue are males and the, and the red are females. And you see an incidence in infants, and then it drops down, and TB almost disappears in the ages of 5 to 10, 10 years of age. And we have no idea why that is. And then it comes back up in adolescence, peaks in sort of the mid-early early years, and keeps going up into the elderly population. And in certain places like Japan, China, and Korea, the elderly population is now responsible for most of the cases of tuberculosis. Natural infection prevents disease. That's data that's shown here, and I'm sorry that this does not come up well, but this is, these are studies where you look at nurses, and these, most of these studies were done in Scandinavia in the 1920s and 1930s. So if you take a group of nurses that are gonna go work in a TB hospital and you skin test them, you will find those that are skin test positive develop active tuberculosis at approximately one half the rate of people that are not skin test positive. So having a prior latent TB infection actually can protect you from developing active TB. And that's a very interesting phenomena that we're following up on and I'll talk about. We have a partially effective vaccine, so we should be able to learn what the correlates are from that partially effective vaccine, and we've been working hard on that over the last 10 years. We now have protection in a very stringent NHP model, which I'll talk about. And we know there are clinical correlates of risk. For example, HIV, anti-TNF factors, in which large numbers of people will develop tuberculosis if not given preemptive therapy, CD4 depletion, and the Mendelian genetics, which show that people with gamma interferon and IL-12 pathway deficiencies are highly susceptible to mycobacteria, including mycobacterium tuberculosis. So let's first talk, talk about BCG. So BCG, probably almost everyone in this room, since we're in Brazil, has received BCG. You've received one of the many forms of BCG, BCG comes in a, in a vast variety of different forms used throughout the world. There is actually tremendous sequence variations between the BCGs used in different parts of the world. The BCG that's used in Brazil is really not used anywhere else. It's Moreau. Uh, Moreau actually, is, you can't see it, but it sits up here in this thing with uh, Russia and with Pasteur. 
Uh, the, most of the people in the world receive BCGs that come from um, the SSI strain, Serum Statin Institute in Denmark, that have been widely propagated around the world. But there's huge variability in BCG. It's the most widely administered vaccine in the world. There have been three billion doses of BCG given. It has very rare serious complications. It was a big concern about HIV, despite the fact WHOs came out and said we should not give HIV exposed or HIV infected infants BCG. It is still widely used everywhere in Africa. No one, no one that I know is actually paying any attention to that WHO recommendation. There is variable protection versus primary infection. It's clearly efficacious against severe TB disease in children. That's the definite part of BCG. Studies with BCG and looking at preventing TB have gone anywhere from zero to 74% risk reduction, with the highest risk reduction being done in studies in the UK and the lowest risk reduction in pulmonary TB being 0% in large studies done in India. So we really don't know what it's done, but what we can say is, Giving BCG to all the infants in the world has really not impacted the TB epidemic since we still have over 10 million cases a year and 1.6 million deaths. So whatever BCG is doing, it certainly is not abating the epidemic. And so we do need new vaccines. So what are the approaches for success? So let's go through pre what we need to do preclinically and what we need to do clinically. So the first thing would be to have a nice validated or natural animal model. So what is a validated or natural animal model? Well, it turns out that over the past 10 years, a group at the University of Pittsburgh led by Joanne Flynn has done a very nice job of describing the low-dose synomalgous macaque model of tuberculosis. And in this model, if you give 20, 10 to 25 CFUs of, of a strain of TB known as Erdman bronchioscopically, usually into the right lower lobe, you can actually get about half the monkeys to go on to active TB, and about half will develop latent TB. And it turns out it doesn't matter whether you do that bronchoscopically or by aerosol. This is a published, uh, publication by Sally Sharp out of England showing that whether she gave this bronchoscopically or by aerosol, she got about the same results. So, and if you do PET scanning, you will find that the lesions that you see in the monkeys are extraordinarily similar to the lesions that are seen by PET scanning in humans. So we now believe that the synomalgous monkey, at least pathophysiologically, pathophysi may reflect the human model. The other thing that's extraordinarily interesting about this model, if you go back and read the, the work that comes out of the University of Pittsburgh, is that while you have active TB in these monkeys and you look at individual granulomatous lesions in these monkeys by PET-CT scanning, you will find in the same monkeys granulomas that are progressing and granulomas that are sterilizing, which means that there may be different immunological aspects to different parts of the lung. If that's the case, then you think, how could we potentially make a vaccine when I have one part of my lung where the immunity is controlling the granuloma and another part of my lung where the granuloma is getting larger? So this is an extraordinarily complicated situation. There have been huge advances in this PET-CT scan imaging that has happened now. So now most of the centers are trying to do major uh, studies in tuberculosis are trying to put in the PET-CT scanners. You can look at lesions, you can look at inflammation. It turns out that the inflamed lesions correlate with the progression to disease, and therefore you can start to do shorter studies. One of the problems with doing tuberculosis studies in macaques is you have to put them in a BSL-3 containment after you infect them. They usually have to be individually caged. The macaque studies are extremely expensive in the range of one to $1.5 million for every study you do in a macaque, looking at either drugs or at, or at vaccines. So by shortening these studies, we're hoping we'll be able to have a higher throughput and to be able to, to look at more vaccine candidates. And we think that by looking at the progression of granulomas over the first six to eight weeks, we will be able to shorten these studies down from what are presently 16 to 24 weeks down to a six to eight week study. It also has allowed us for the first time to do prospectively powered trials. Until last year, there was never a prospectively powered trial, which means people didn't actually say how many monkeys you're going to put in, what's the change going to be, do it up front. What we did is we did studies where we vaccinated, we looked at the control group and the monkey group, we did a whole bunch of assessments, and we sort of said, this looks good and this doesn't. But we can finally start to do prospectively controlled trials. And PET-CT scanning is very nice because you can actually just add up all of the infl inflammatory responses on the computer. It takes away the subjectivity of CT reading or chest X-ray reading, 
and has been far more reproducible than either of those other imaging modalities. And the animal model development. What else do we need to do in an animal model? Well, as I mentioned, when you grow TB in culture, in order for it not to clump and for you to be able to calculate how many CFUs of TB you need, you have to put a small amount of detergent in, which is usually something like tween. If you do that, what happens is there is a natural capsule that's on TB. If you look at the strains that are either gotten straight out of lungs or if you look at strains that are grown in what are called the pollicular interface, and that capsule is missing from these other kinds of things that we actually use as our challenge strains, which means that when we go in and vaccinate or when we challenge, we are not challenging with the natural form of the organism in any way. We have stripped the capsule off of tuberculosis. So we're trying to look at how we can possibly do other studies. And there's some very interesting studies that came back from Johns Hopkins back in the 1950s, where what they did is they took guinea pigs and they put them downstream from humans. So you take the air, air that comes out of humans that are infected with TB that are coughing, you stick the guinea pigs in the vents downstream, and you can infect a great number of those guinea pigs by putting them downstream. Obviously, that pathogen, which is in the air, in the droplet, with all of the crap that comes out of the lung, is there, and this may be a better natural model. So what's been happening is we are looking at that and trying to either do human to guinea pig studies or primate to guinea pig studies. There's been one high take rate at a recent study, at, again in England, whether that can be verified and we can start to use the primate to guinea pig model for looking at a natural transmission model of tuberculosis is very hopeful. The other thing that's happened is, is all the mouse studies of, of different tuberculosis vaccines have looked at using, out, using basically inbred, very clean mice. And it's clear that those of us out in the community are not inbred and we don't live in a clean environment. We've been exposed to hundreds, if not thousands, of different non-tuberculous mycobacteria which have skewed our immune responses. So one of the things we're trying to do now is actually use dirty mice, that is, trying to house mice in conditions where they're exposed to dirt, they're exposed to other mycobacteria. And Chris has got a very, Chris Cassetti at the University of Massachusetts, a Howard Hughes investigator, has a very nice use of a, a mouse system called the collaborative cross, where they've taken a large number of outbred strains of mice, formed 40 crosses, and each one of those is genetically different but outbred. If you look at those outbred mice, those 40 strains of genetically similar but outbred mice, and you infect them with TB, there will be up to four log differences in the, in the amount of tuberculosis that is in those different strains of mice. So we have, over the past 40 years, used almost always black six and Balb C mice. It is clear that that may have misled us in terms of some of the considerations we have for either vaccine candidates or the pathophysiology. So the other thing is, is we need to mimic the pre-exposure of humans to mycobacteria. That's problematic because in primate centers, once you BCG vaccinate, then you can't skin test very effectively. The way that primate centers try to show that they do not have tuberculosis is by skin testing. They do not like to BCG vaccinate. But what we've done is we've taken a very large colony of, of macaques in the Netherlands and BCG vaccinated them at birth. We will wait for them to become adolescents, which takes three years, but that will allow us to mimic a more natural situation of what vaccines would look like in adolescents in humans. Up until this point, what we've been doing is giving BCG, and then four to six weeks later is giving a boost. That does not recapitulate what happens in humans where you get BCG at birth, and then we would, pretend we would like to vaccinate with our new candidates sometime in the age that we vaccinate with HPV, which would be in the 12 to 15 year old range. So how about the measurement of bacterial burden? So if we're gonna look at latency, it would be nice to know about bacterial burden. So there's another thing that's actually come out of the HIV vaccine field, which is going to revolutionize some of our animal studies, both our primate studies and our um, mouse studies, as well as potentially human challenge studies, which I will also talk about. And that's to barcode the bacteria. So what you do is you take a group of bacteria and you assign them individual barcodes. And you can even make different libraries that have different barcodes. And if you put those bacteria in and you say put 100 bacteria in, you can now go and look and see whether you've changed the founder population. 
And it turns out that in the studies done at Pittsburgh, that the number of granulomas that are established does correlate with some of the downstream pathophysiological consequences. So by putting barcodes in, and then going in and just taking the whole long and seeing whether you have affected the barcode founder population, you can see whether there's been an effect of your vaccine on decreasing the number of bacteria which have established initial lesions. And what I'm showing you here is a very beautiful publication, again, from the Lynn Group, which where they infused 25 different strains of TB into, into macaques, each barcoded. Then they took out every single granuloma, which they do. They, they look at every granuloma. And the interesting thing is, is that almost every granuloma is founded by a single bacillus. So how many TB does it take to form a granuloma? The answer is one. And it was unclear about that before. And the majority of granuloma are formed by one. But interestingly, if you look at the lymph node, although some lymph nodes only have one strain, many lymph nodes will have five or six of the strains, five or more of the strains that were infused. So the draining lymph nodes will then look more mixed in the individual granulomatous lesions. The interesting thing about this is that if you go in and you do just full genome sequencing on the mouse lungs, which Chris Sassetti has done and has now published this paper, even though this does not look like a big change, this is a BCG vaccinated group and this is the regular group. And where this starts to drop off is where you, uh, where you see the, where the actual number of founder organisms are. And if you look at that, there's about a 40% decrease in the total number of founders. So we can see an effect, and this is another way to look at bacterial burden, which is beautiful. It would also mean if we could look at bacterial burden and look at this over time, that we may be able to study latency in greater detail, which would be really nice. So how do you do that? You need to develop a sensitive marker to count the bacteria in blood, urine, or exhaled. So if I wanted to take an animal, establish latency, and then give a vaccine, I need to have a way to measure the bacterial burden. I really don't have that now. So what you can do is you can basically make genetically engineered strain for a macaque that has an extraordinarily sensitive biomarker in it, for example, a picomolar. And then actually we think we can get down to detecting the total number of bacteria in an animal down to about 10 to the three total bacteria, actually by using a volatile thing that can be measured, a volatile substance encoded into the bacteria that can be measured in their exhaled air. So all of these tools are coming together at a time which will allow us to use animal models, bacterial barcoded strains, strains that have sensitive markers where we can measure bacterial burden. And we think this will partially revolutionize our ability to, met, to, to actually look at new vaccines and better understand the effects they are having. We need appropriate models of control to generate hypotheses. Up until the last four years, there has never been a successful TB monkey vaccine study. That's changed. There have now been two major vaccine studies that have shown protection. The first was done again by the Pittsburgh group using a low-dose challenge of a vaccine called H56, which is now in, the, in clinic, and I'll talk about that shortly, which is a fusion protein of two different major proteins of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, it's three different proteins from um, TB. ESAT6 antigen 85B and a latency antigen known as RV2660 in an adjuvant known as IC31. And what they showed in that is they showed challenge in terms of the total bacterial burden by PET scan, but they also showed when they took the latent animals that they had vaccinated and they gave them TNF, they couldn't, re re they couldn't reactivate any of the TB from the vaccinated group, but they were able to easily reactivate the TB from the BCG vaccinated group. So although this is quite expensive, it does establish somewhat of a model of latency where you use TNF to reactivate. The other thing that will reactivate all of these animals is SIV infection. So the other thing that's happened in terms of a, of a new animal model that looks more promising for going in and, and determining correlates of protection is actually to use aerosol BCG. And there is a body of evidence that the aerosol route is likely more protective for almost all vaccines that have been studied in the context of tuberculosis. And here I show you a summary from a large number of studies, and I'm sorry for the, sorry for the focus here, which seems to have been a little out. But these are studies where you are looking at the log reduction, and I'm sorry this scale is not clear here. This is the log reduction in TB, and this, these are in mouse models, by BCG, give, BCG either given intradermally or aerosol, 
Dendritic cell back vaccines given either intramuscularly or aerosol, and adenovirus vector vaccines either given intramuscularly or aerosol. And what you can see in every case is by delivering the vaccine directly into the lung in the mouse model, you see greater protection uh, from challenge, from a non-transmissible challenge. This has been seen now in a variety of different models. It's been seen in guinea pigs. There have been aerosolized studies done in cows, which of course are very susceptible to Mycobacterium bovis and are a huge problem in the world. And there are also now studies in primates on, that have been done with BCG aerosol that look very promising. So what does that mean? What it means is that we have now got come up with a leading hypothesis of what we think we need to do. Whether this hypothesis has, is correct at all is very controversial, but at least it's a hypothesis we can test. And the hypothesis is that we need a constant and renewable supply of rapidly acting effector T cells in the lung because you can't wait for tuberculosis to get established. It may be too late. You probably need them pre-primed and there, along with potential contributions from innate cells and possibly antibody-mediated mechanisms. And the leading candidates for doing those right now are aerosolized BCG, CMV-encoded candidates, which I'll talk about shortly, as well as aerosol vectors. And for aerosol vectors, we're mostly looking at adenoviruses and poxviruses given by an aerosolized root, both of which have been given by aerosolized roots to humans. So we are now doing NHP studies of aerosolized BCG as well as human studies of BCG. The reason to do that is we can give the aerosol BCG. We know that we get about a one and a half log better protection. We can compare the aerosol route to the, uh, to the intradermal route and see if we see differences in, the, in protection measured in, by very great immunological correlates, most of this work being done at the VRC, uh, from which you heard many speakers this morning. And we will look at the primary import and then try to correlate that with human immunogenicity when we give BCG by aerosol. Now you say BCG by aerosol. It was given by aerosol in the 60s, and there are now two groups giving BCG. Helen McShane at Oxford University has given 10 to the 6 BCG by aerosol with absolutely no side effects whatsoever. And there have been even a higher dose given at studies that are being done in Cape Town, South Africa. So even though it sounds like it may be a long stretch to get BCG by aerosol, this actually may be a promising approach. I'll remind people that measles vaccine, there were four million doses of measles vaccine given by aerosol in Mexico in the last decade. The other thing that's been quite exciting is that there's a new candidate both in the SIV world and HIV world as well as the TB world, and this is using the CMV. So CMV has this funny aspect that the immune responses that you get to CMV persist for life, okay? The cells don't necessarily persist for life, but the immune responses persist for life because these are mostly either transitional effector cells or effector cells. They die out over time, but they are constantly being replaced at a very high level. If you look at older people in the audience, such as myself and Mike Letterman, then you will find out that if you are CMV seropositive, we will have somewhere between 5 and 10% of our total CD8 population controlling CMV. So CMV is a highly persistent, which means that we, if you give this, what you can show is, is there are high levels of effector memory T cells in tissues that persist for a long period of time. That's exactly the hypothesis that I just stated. So we did a study with Lewis Picker at Oregon University, and I'm not going to go through it in any detail. This is in the rhesus macaque model. There has never been any protection seen in any rhesus macaque model ever. The, sh the study I showed you with the H56 vaccine was done in the Cinemogus model. Rhesus macaques, if given one CFU of TB, almost every macaque will be dead in approximately 16 weeks. This is an extraordinarily high bar model. And in this model, using a CMV vaccine that encoded nine antigens, we saw better protection than we have ever seen in any other model. This study has now been re repeated using a slightly lower challenge dose. The data were better on the second um, challenge. I'm not going to show that data here. And the paper has been submitted and is under review. This is actually somewhat revolutionary in that we finally are seeing protection in the most stringent model of non-human primates. We're also doing aerosolized chimpanzee ad and MVA studies. As I said, Helen McShane and the group at Oxford have both given aerosolized chimp adenoviruses to humans at fairly high doses. 
And they have also given aerosolized modified vaccinia ankara, which is one of the pox virus vaccines. And the combination of adenovirus and MVA have been used in a variety of settings, including in some of the groundbreaking studies for Ebola in Africa. So this is not just a preclinical potential for looking at new vaccine candidates. It is a potential clinical candidate for looking at vaccines. And the program at ARIS, where I was, is now using a five antigen construct with two industry partners and the low-dose NHP challenge study using aerosolized adenovirus followed by aerosolized pox virus in the non-human primate model is ongoing. <clears throat> How about novel antigens? How do you choose when you have 4,000 antigens? Well, that's not the right question. The right question is, why are we always focused on proteins? So it turns out that proteins, right, are only one part of the surface of tuberculosis. In fact, they are a minor part of the surface of tuberculosis. Most of the surface of tuberculosis is made up of, uh, made up of glycolipids. So it's both the lipid component or they're made up of, of um, the, the carbohydrate structures as well. Things that you may have heard of such as rabamannan or liporabamannan and a variety of other structures. And it turns out that many of the T cells that you see in TB are not restricted by the classic things you've heard about, class one and class two, but are restricted by HLAE. They are CD1 restricted, and many people may have heard of this group of presenting molecules that are in the MHC1 family. The CD1 system was discovered using tuberculosis antigens. That's where it was first described. And it turns out that a large number of tuberculosis antigens are presented by CD1A, B, and C not tremendous amount by CD1D, which it presents to uh, NKT cells, but these are very important. There are huge numbers of MR1-restricted T cells. MR1 restricts a set of T cells called mates. Mates are basically mucosal-associated invariant T cells. They are presented by non-polymorphic molecules, which means that we all have the same. We all share the same HLAE molecule. There's only one amino acid difference in the entire population, so we all have the same HLAE. In fact, we have the same HLAE as rhesus macaques and cinnamalgus macaques. So these have been down for a long time. And there are also a huge number of gamma delta T cells that have been seen, and there are approaches now for vaccinating to induce gamma delta T cells, especially using listeria-based vaccines. If you actually look at BCG vaccination, and you look and you say, what are the cell populations that are there? And once again, I apologize for the focus across the screen here, but you'll see that they are mates, they're NK cells or gamma delta T cells, and a variety of other NK cells that are CD1 restricted. So the concept that the T cells that you see post-vaccination with BCG are the classic class one and class two is simply not the case. How about antibody-based approaches? Antibodies are, are, have been thrown out as TB. People have said antibody's not important. Uh, part of that came from studies done in the 1920s and 1930s, uh, where they did serum transfer from patients that had active TB and to either patients that were latently infected or patients with active TB. The two leaders in the field of the day, Camille and Trudeau, in the France and Trudeau in the United States, came out and said, this is all a bunch of garbage. And since, because they were the leaders, nobody investigated it for about 30 years, which is, you know, too bad because the dogma is probably not correct. And it turns out there are multiple antigens we're now under study, and these are a list of the antigens we're now looking at. And once we have a natural transmission model, we will much better be able to look and see whether the antibody responses to any of these potential antigens that may be important in protecting could be useful in generating a tuberculosis vaccine. So there's a lot of excitement about using a combined antibody approach as well as a T-cell approach and that T-cell approach is not necessarily one that is inducing classic CD4 and classic CD8 positive T-cells, but one that may be inducing one of these more atypical cellular responses. So studies of CD1-inducing vaccines, mate-inducing vaccines, and gamma-delta T-cell-inducing vaccines are all being planned to go in the clinic in the next two to three years, which is really exciting for vaccinology because these may have applications to other fields and they had never been tried in other settings. So how about clinically? So we need the ability to conduct safe, self, and well-controlled trials. So the first major trial that was conducted was an infant trial that was published a few years ago by the group in Cape Town, South Africa. We ran this out of ARIS and with funds from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, mostly. 
And what we did is we randomized about 3,000 infants to either using an MVA vaccine that encoded a single antigen or placebo, measured endpoints. We had approximately 73 endpoints in the trial. You can see here there was no, absolutely no difference between the vaccinated and the placebo group. And so that was very disappointing. People said it was a failure, that this was horrible because the first major TB vaccine we did, phase 2B, was a you know, horrible mess and everybody should quit. Of course, that didn't stop HIV, which did four files, trials that failed, actually five now, uh, of large vaccines. So we do think we need to push ahead. But what did we learn? Well, we learned that we could conduct a phase 2B study in infants. People said you'll never be able to do it. These vaccines are going to cause all sorts of risks. They're going to be all sorts of problems. We learned a lot about the correlative risk, very similar to the study Danny Dewitt gave this morning. You take the people that got, T that got TB and the people you didn't, you pool the placebo and the vaccines because there was no protection, and you can start looking at correlates of risk. And we came up with a gene signature of 17 genes, which was then validated in an adolescent cohort in another part of Africa. And we could use back correlations to the animal model, and we're still trying to convince the funders that we need to go back in the Cinemagus model, try MVA to see whether it protects in that model. It did not protect in the rhesus macaque model, which is the stringent model. So why were we wrong? Was it the wrong hypothesis, inducing Th1 cells, CD4 positive Th1 cells that make gamma interferon? Was it the magnitude or quality of the response that was done in infants? The number of spots that were induced of gamma interferon was only about 70 to 80 mean. If you give this same vaccine twice to adults, you can get about 400 to 500. Should the study have been in and done, done in adults? In retrospect, probably so. Was it the wrong antigen? So you're using one single antigen out of 4,000. It's unlikely that a single antigen may protect, although it is working for herpes zoster, which is a used virus. Was it the infant population that they couldn't respond well and that they were immunologically less, more susceptible and unable to mount the kind of responses? Or was it environmental preconditioning? And we actually do not know the answer to all those questions. But what we do have is a large portfolio of candidates now which we didn't have. So in, in 1999, there were zero TB vaccine studies being conducted in the world. And what happened is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation decided that this was unacceptable. They started funding. And as they came on board and the EU came on board with major funding, and Europe has been one of the great funders of tuberculosis vaccines, in many ways much larger than the United States, a large number of candidates have come through the clinic. And I will talk about those in a second. But we have candidates in phase three, phase 2B, phase 2A, and a variety of candidates in phase one with a large number of approaches. But unfortunately, almost all of them have the immunologic hypothesis that we need to induce Th1. That's why it's nice that we're starting to see candidates that will induce antibody or that will induce other responses. How about safety? There's this thing called the Koch reaction when um, Robert Koch ground up TB and delivered it intravenously or subcutaneous to patients with TB. He resu resulted in some deaths. There were some very severe reactions. It actually almost killed his career, despite the fact that he is widely acknowledged as the founder of TB. There's been great concern that by going into basically TST-positive patients with these vaccines that we're going to see cock reactions, we're going to see all sorts of T cells against these things in the lung. People are going to drop dead. Everything's going to go wrong. And the truth is, is that in 8,000, now it's about 10,000 subjects enrolled in 33 trials since 2006, we've seen really no evidence of a Koch reaction. We had one very bizarre reaction, which is one of the candidates called a recombinant BCG, which encoded a molecule called perfringent lysin to allow it to escape the lysosome, and then overexpressed three antigens, had two cases of clinical zoster in young people and we had to stop that trial. The likelihood of that occurring by chance alone was one in 200,000. So out of 20 patients, we had two cases of zoster. Why that zoster was induced, we still have absolutely no idea. How about a cost-effective approach to proof, proof of concept? That MVA trial in 3,000 infants, was, the cost of that trial was approximately 35 to $40 million. So you just can't go off doing 35 and $40 million trials. So you need to think about ways to do trials in more cost-effective manners, and you, manner, and you need to think about ways to be more innovative in the way you do your clinical trials. So this is just, again, this is the progression of what happens in TB. So you get exposed. If you're close contact, about 30% of people will become infected. 
about 70% of people won't become infected. Some of those will have early progression, many will contain. Some of those will then go on to late progression or contain, containment. So there's multiple numbers of places where you could do vaccine studies. You could try to prevent infection. People have thought that might be too hard to do, and I'll talk about that in a second. You could try to prevent recurrence, because recurrence rates in TB are about 4%, so that would be a lot, much smaller population. Or you could try to prevent progression in selected high-risk patients, which is why I asked the, why we're looking at gene signatures or other selection modalities to narrow the spectrum of people we would enroll. Should we enroll diabetics, smokers, certain age groups, to try to decrease the number of patients we need for the number of subjects we need for these studies? Why do we think we can prevent infection? We didn't think for a long time we could prevent infection, but there have been a very nice series of papers, including a meta-analysis done over the last six years. Since we now have gamma interferon release assay tests, which are not influenced by BCG, we can go back and look at BCG vaccinated versus non-BCG vaccinated, and then measure the IGRA responses in those subjects. And if you do that, what you find is that BCG, given in multiple populations throughout the world, has not only prevented some degree of disease, it has actually prevented infection. So the people that get BCG have a lower rate of gamma interferon positive responses than a control group of the same age in the same country, which is quite interesting. That effect varies anywhere from about 15% to 50%, but it's been extremely reproducible and is probably real. Since, we can probably, since BCG can prevent infection, let's use some new vaccine candidates and try to prevent infection. How do you do that? Well, that's very nice because the rate of infection is 10 times higher than the rate of disease. When you get infected, only about 10% of people go on to get disease. So you take a naive population, you screen them by quantifieron or gamma interferon release assay test, you give them a vaccine or placebo, you give a washout for approximately three months so you don't miss cases that we call prevalent that might have been there at the beginning. And then you follow people and you measure their IGRAs every six months. And if they convert, you also look to see whether they convert, whether they have a stable conversion. Maybe it turns out that those people vaccinated will convert their, their gamma interferon tests, but then control the disease, decrease their antigen load, and reconvert back to negative. And it is well known that people can go from being skin test positive to skin test negative or IGRA positive to IGRA negative. If you do this study, instead of enrolling 3,000 people, we're doing a three-arm study of 990 adolescents in South Africa. We, in South Africa, 10% of the population in, school, in schools outside of Cape Town become infected with TB each year. We put in that there would be a 7% infection rate. That study is now fully enrolled. We're in the second year of follow-up. It will be unblinded in two quarters. We're all excited to see the results of this. One arm is BCG. Could BCG revaccination prevent infection in these people? You may know that there was a very, very large BCG revaccination trial done in Brazil, the one of the largest trials ever done called REVAC. In that study, there was no efficacy of BCG revaccination on TB disease. However, they did not look at infection. And we are doing, this study is now ongoing and will be unblinded soon. There is a second study that started in Tanzania using a non-killed tuberculosis mycobacterial vaccine that was developed at Dartmouth. That, patient, that trial has 600 patients. It is now also fully enrolled. It has two years of follow-up and will be unblinded in approximately 18 months. So we'll be excited to see whether these prevention of infection trials may be useful because we can do them at much less the cost than doing a prevention of disease trial. The other thing is you could look at decreasing recurrence. So you take patients that are, on t that are getting treated for TB, at the end of their, their treatment for their susceptible TB, you vaccinate them and you look at recurrence. You take their initial strain out, and when they recur, you can compare the two strains to see if, they, if the recurrence was reinfection or relapse. In South Africa, we think that reinfection is about 70% of disease. In India, it's probably about 20% of disease. If you prevent relapse, then that means that you're likely to be able to use this as a latency vaccine to prevent relapse in those people that are controlling it. So you can go into a latently infected population. However, if you decrease reinfection, it might work as a prophylaxic vaccine. And also, if you decrease recurrence, you might even want to try to use it therapeutically early in disease. 
So these are beautiful studies to design because by sequencing the, the initial isolate and sequencing the isolate that comes later, you may be able to determine whether this is a relapse phenomena or reinfection phenomena, which is would then guide your vaccine development. And two studies are about to start, one using a candidate called ID93 in South Africa, and another one called VPM1002 that's being done in India. There are three other major, so there are three major studies that are coming out. So there is a GSK, ARIS, M72, and 3,600 quantifiron positive patients that were done at 10 sites in South Africa, Kenya, and Zambia. The enrollment is complete. We are, uh, it is an endpoint-driven trial. So we expect out of 3,600 patients, if we have vaccine efficacy, we will stop the trial at 23 endpoints. It gives you a sense of how hard these trials are to do. We now have accumulated almost 23 endpoints. This trial will be unblinded in probably the first quarter of next year. There is this prevention of infection study that I told you that we will also have either in the fourth quarter of this year or the first quarter of next year, the results of. And then there was a study done in China where they took 10,000 subjects. They screened 120,000 people in China. It took them three weeks. Then they took those people, they took 10,000 subjects Vax of those that were, had skin tests greater than 15 millimeters. They enrolled those 10,000 subjects in two months. Gives you an idea of some of the, the systems in China that are in place. Gave them five vaccines or following them for two years. And that study we're waiting on the results of at any time. That's a heat killed non tuber That is actually a lysate of a non-tuberculous mycobacterium known as Mvaki. Lastly, what we really need to develop vaccines, and what certain fields have that we don't have, is a human challenge model. So malaria vaccines have been revolutionized by the ability to do challenge models. RSV vaccines use human challenge models. Esper and I did influenza challenge models immunology when we were in Rochester together, which is fascinating because you can collect the samples before, you challenge them, you get the samples after. They're beautiful systems. So could we make a challenge model for TB that would allow us to evaluate uh, candidates. And actually, there is a very large effort ongoing to develop a human challenge model of tuberculosis. And the way to do that is to use a strain that can replicate for a small period of time, and then to be able to absolutely kill it using two different effector mechanisms. The two effector mechanisms that are being used to look at killing that vaccine is to use a what's called a TET system, so you can give the person doxycycline. When you take the doxycycline away, it kills them by having genes under that, it kills them. And the second system that's being looked at is using unnatural amino acids. So what you do is you use a stop codon, an amber stop codon. You have the bacteria incorporate an unnatural amino acid when it's in seen in the presence of a regular organism like a human. They can no longer encode that amino acid. The stop codon is red. And you put that into three or four different locations in the genome to try to keep that from occurring. The other thing we're doing is taking those strains and we're both labeling them using the barcoding mechanism and we're labeling them using the soluble markers. So the idea will be to actually give a replication-competent tuberculosis construct to humans by aerosol that would replicate for a short period of time, have two killing mechanisms that have escapes that are left in 10 to the minus 12th, and to have a soluble marker where we can measure the actual bacterial burden. If we do that, it will absolutely revolutionize TB vaccines. It is a very difficult task. There is a large group that's undertaking this. Whether we will be successful is unknown, but everyone believes it's worth the effort to at least try. And lastly, we should do small exploratory studies using intensive immunology. As with other people, we are doing studies using leukophoresis. So what we do is we will go in, people complain about not having samples to use. So for example, by using leukophoresis, BCG vaccinating, instead of getting two or three or four vials, we can put, usually put down somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 vials per subject. And that way we can supply those out to groups. You can use those to validate assays across groups. And so we are trying in all of our phase one studies to set these up in sites where we can do leukophoresis so we can use these for either standardized, um, for standardized assay development or to look at standardized correlates of immunity. There's been a lot of work doing transcriptional analysis in the vaccine trials using systems immunology. There are ongoing intensive studies using candidate vaccines, a study with the HVN called 062, where we're looking at about 13 different immunologic assays to see which ones we can have the greatest variability and which ones we can validate. 
And there are planned studies, as I mentioned, to measure these novel T cell substates, mates, gamma delta, CD1 positive T cells in new studies. So why are we going to be successful with tuberculosis vaccines and why am I excited about where we are in the development? First of all, nature tells us it's possible, which is great because that's to develop a vaccine. It's nice to know that you can have natural protection. We started down the path only in the last 10 years with minimal funding. As I said, we are really the underfunded godchild of the HIV, malaria, and TB world. So we're hoping that by doing that, we will be successful. We have present clinical and preclinical studies that are going to inform our developmental plans and our candidates. We're starting to develop the tools, the understanding, and the clinical expertise to develop the problem. And I think there is a recognition from the community that a vaccine is urgently and desperately needed. So I'd like to give special thanks to many of my collaborators, specifically the group at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, where I spent last year, part of last year on sabbatical, the University of Oxford, Helen McShane, who I work closely with, ERIS and the TBVI, which is the European initial for TB, the group at England that does primate studies, the group at Pittsburgh, and most importantly, I think we got to give a lot of uh, kudos to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for recognizing that TB vaccines are urgently needed and putting the money there to actually get a lot of this done when other funders have not done that. But the EU, including DFID, the foreign arm of the UK, DGIS, and Australia have also been quite generous as well as many of the manufacturers that are there. And of course, to all of the staff, volunteer, and families that have given their time working to develop new tuberculosis vaccines. So I'll stop there. I know that was sort of a flurry of activity and take questions. <laughs>